and the bit of quick energy. I wonder that smart shoppers everywhere take time out to pause and refresh. And where else but in the fountain where they serve ice-cold Coca-Cola? In 1885, a pharmacist came across a tonic he would develop, name, and sell as Coca-Cola. Nearly 150 years later, from the exact ingredients to shady business and ecological practices, there is a lot the world does not know about its favorite soft drink. Colonel John Pemberton survived the Civil War, but due to injury was addicted to morphine. He sought a substitute for the drug, and in 1885 as a pharmacist, he registered Pemberton's French Wine Cola, a nerve tonic containing alcohol. The following year, prohibition laws were passed in America, so Pemberton and his colleagues came up with a non-alcoholic version, Coca-Cola the Temperance Drink. The company has kept the drink's key ingredient secret for over a century, but whispers that it contains the drug cocaine have persisted. The first formula did contain the then legal cocaine, along with caffeine. Pemberton used 5 ounces of coca leaf in every gallon of syrup used, but as the company grew and the formula altered, it was thought that one glass of the drink contained as much as 9 milligrams of the drug. In 1903, early sales had been high, predominantly among the Afro-American community, largely due to them being prohibited from drinking at public water fountains. The white community complained that they feared the ingredients would affect the behavior of Afro-Americans, and so changes were made. By 1929, Coca-Cola began to use a cocaine-free coca leaf extract, and the only company in the USA today authorized with the government to import and process coca leaves is Stepan which extracts cocaine from the leaves before selling them to Coca-Cola. The leaves, along with what is thought to be vanilla and cinnamon extract, give the drink much of its flavor. The entire formula for the drink remains a mystery, guarded in a vault in a museum in Atlanta. The ingredients are shipped to factories in the form of anonymous merchandise numbered 1-9. through nine. Factory workers are told what quantity is used for each number and are given instructions on the mixing procedure. It is thought that number 1 is sugar, in the form of sucrose, number 2 is caramel coloring, Number 3 is caffeine. Number 4 is phosphoric acid. Ingredients 5 through 9 are unknown. The formulas for the various drinks now available are so closely guarded that in 2006, a secretary at Coca-Cola's global headquarters stole a vial of a new drink which she planned to sell to Pepsi for $1.5 million. Pepsi informed Coca-Cola and FBI agents were on hand to arrest her. Whatever is in the recipes, it is today widely accepted that sugary, gassy drinks are bad for us. Coca-Cola has long sought to override that with marketing messages of happiness and contentment and a product that brings the whole world together. In its early days, the drink was generally considered to be, and marketed as, a medical tonic, good for the brain and a settler for both stomach and nerves. That has changed over the years. A 2015 report from Harvard stated that drinking just one or two cans of sugary beverages daily are 26% more likely to get type 2 diabetes. Another report argued that 184,000 global deaths stem from the consumption of such drinks. Even the diet versions have received criticism from nutritionists due to just one can of Coca-Cola with stevia containing 37% of an adult's recommended daily intake of sugar. Despite these concerns, it has been alleged that Coca-Cola signed contracts with high schools assuring that their product was to be sold exclusively in the vending machines. Coca-Cola was said to be eager to become part of children's lives to have their custom life and was widely criticized for selling a drink to young people that contains a highly addictive ingredient such as caffeine. In the 1980s, Coca-Cola began lobbying government officials and donating to particular campaigns. In return, it received perks such as lower sugar taxes. It took time and spent money to cast doubts on scientific research, producing studies that suggested there was, in fact, no link between soft drinks and obesity. In 1999, 30 million cans of Coca-Cola were withdrawn from shelves in Belgium after nearly 100 consumers complained of stomach pains, palpitations, headaches, and nausea. Many felt it was merely psychosomatic mass hysteria, but Coca-Cola did admit to a fungicide contaminating the outside of cans and bad carbon dioxide in the drinks. During World War II, Coca-Cola flourished. Sugar was rationed, but thanks to lobbying, the drink was deemed essential and its supposed benefits, such as boosting morale, were recognized and then celebrated by the government. That same government even paid for bottling plants overseas, and the US military were akin to a sales force for the drink around the world. Coca-Cola had been long distributed at Hitler Youth Rallies and in 1939 had sold 4.5 million cases in Germany. But as the war escalated, supplies were severed. 
Max Keith, a prominent Nazi sympathizer in charge of Coca-Cola Germany, used his influence to produce a similar product called Fanta. It is alleged that this was made at Nazi labor camps. It has become hugely popular and all profits went to Coca-Cola. As well as its labor forces, it is argued that Coca-Cola has exploited overseas land and water supplies, causing poor quality and drastic shortages in the latter in India and Latin America. In 2004, Coca-Cola opened a factory in the state of Kerala. It wasn't long before locals complained that not only had their water supply become toxic, but also that the wells were running dry. The factory was closed down by local officials. The company noted that a report had stated that a lack of rainfall was the main reason for the dry wells. Reports, however, had also noted that the local water supply had been contaminated by a toxic sludge. In 2004, Coca-Cola used 62 billion gallons of water. Today, that figure is up to 67 billion gallons. In the early 21st century, trade unions all over the world called for a boycott of Coca-Cola products when it was alleged that the company's locally owned bottlers in Colombia had used paramilitary organizations to intimidate, torture, and even kill union workers. In 2001, Colombian food and drink union, Sinal Trainal, sued Coca-Cola and the bottling firm, claiming that nine union members had been killed over 13 years. The suit claimed that the bottling companies had contracted with or otherwise directed paramilitary security forces that utilized extreme violence and murdered, tortured, unlawfully detained, or otherwise silenced trade union leaders. And, by association, Coca-Cola was also responsible. A U.S. federal court judge soon removed Coca-Cola from the suit as the incidents had occurred overseas and in 2009 the company won an appeal for lack of evidence to the link of paramilitaries with Coca-Cola. However, from the center trainal's actions, a movement against Coca-Cola continues and a website called Killer Coke aims at shining a light on alleged atrocities from child labor in El Salvador to continued water contamination in the USA, India, and Mexico. Coca-Cola remains the world's most popular drink. The company is among the biggest on the planet, selling 500 different brands. Like all gigantic enterprises, there will always be skeletons in the closet. And despite the constant suspicions concerning its methods and ethics, the company strives to assure skeptics that through global projects such as replenishing the environment with much of the water it uses, it can be a force for good. Yet, Coca-Cola remains the single largest plastic polluter in the world, producing 3 million tons of plastic each year. Greenpeace continues to criticize Coca-Cola's single-use plastics, claiming that the company lobbies governments against environmental proposals, relies on the myth of recycling, and wrongly focuses on the public's ability to not litter. It seems Coca-Cola's legacy won't just be the drink it gave the world, but how the company helps to save the same world. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and maybe subscribe. Also, please check out this book, Unsolved Secrets, Mysteries and Conspiracies That Have Puzzled the Greatest Minds by Leo Moynihan and Sam Pilger. Um, this story is actually in this book and it really helped me with the research on it and kind of gave me the idea. So I just want to give credit where credit's due and definitely go check out this book and the other ones that they have. And thanks so much for watching.